and see if uh, I can sort of take you through a little journey for uh, 40, 45, 50 minutes of a couple of issues. Uh, the, way, the way I structured this talk is a uh, little bit about uh, new types of interactions uh, happening on the planet now, uh, largely because of, of, of us, and also take you into the whole idea of so social ecological systems and what that means and uh, how it relates to resilient thinking. And then give you s a few examples at the end of, of shifts from sort of uncoordinated management into more of a seascape approach or ecosystem stewardship uh, in, in marine systems. So let's start up with, uh, with uh, this picture basically illustrating that it's a fairly new era on, on Earth right now with, with lots of processes and, and dynamics being shaped by us. And actually so new that some people have now started to call it the Anthropocene, changing the name from the Holocene era to the Anthropocene era, the era of man or, or a planet shaped by human actions. Uh, on this picture illustrates the incredible acceleration that uh, our species has had, especially since the Second World War. Uh, if you think about it, it took us about 200,000 years to become one billion people. That uh, happened in 1800. And, uh, and uh, now we're seven billion. So in a very short period, we're really taking off as an, as a, as an organism of, on Earth, actually. Uh, quite impressive, but if you look at it from outside, it may, may almost look like an insect population, actually, in that sense. Uh, we have an enormous scale increase, uh, and here it, it is captured in terms of technology and uh, world GDP. Uh, some people in the Earth System Science uh, communities, they call it this the Great Acceleration. And uh, here are graphs of, of uh, this acceleration that basically happened in all domains since uh, the Second uh, World War. And you also have fisheries there, uh, the d discussion we heard from Trevor yesterday about about, about fisheries and uh, basically the consensus that we have sort of reached the roof for expanding global fisheries now and looking more into aquaculture as a complement or uh, expanding source. So my point is that there is nothing wrong in this. This is just the way it looks like. And, and it's an amazing achievement, uh, actually, I think, uh, that we have been able to, to scale up our enterprise like this. And actually, in relative peace, uh, there are bad things happening here and there all the time, but on, on a global scale, we are in relative peace, probably thanks to the global interconnectedness we, we're living with. Some people have tried to look at those uh, imprints on marine systems. This is a paper by Ben Halpern and others. Another way we illustrate this new era is um, from a piece we had a couple of years back in on uh, aquaculture, where we looked at uh, fish meal for shrimp farms in, in Thailand. So. Uh, so if someone would have a sushi tonight with a shrimp on, it's interesting to note that that shrimp may have got fish meal from, from all over the world. So it means that we globalize not only in the, in the sense of how we transport ourselves around the planet or how we have financial markets that interact or, or, or other type of trade communities, but we also <coughs> globalized in the ecological domain, illustrated by one place basically having access to all marine systems worldwide for for producing one commodity. Uh, often people think about it that we get it from one system here, we get everything and then we export it. But this illustrates that we are connected also in the ecological domain in, 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 new, f in new ways in this globalization process. This is a hopeless figure in many respects, but it, it illustrates uh, interconnectedness basically between climate ecosystems, human health and economic systems. And in this, uh, on the left side, you have the, uh, the scale increases in terms of greenhouse gases, antibiotic resistance, the connectivity in our eco ecological, economic, and social systems, urbanization, rising human numbers, per capita use, and so on and so forth. And the interesting part here is, is, that, is that these interacting new ways, and uh, often we've been thinking about the climate issue as a separate issue and how it will impact marine systems. We think about how an economic system will impact the supply chain for fisheries. But there are new types of interactions happening. And a classical example that people often talk about is the fires in Russia in, on, in the crop fields 
that created an export ban for, for crops uh, and uh, that created a, a ways into Arab countries and perhaps one of the triggers for the, for the Arab Spring we have seen in the, in the last couple of years. There are many of these type of interactions and in the, in the marine realm you can think about the rule of supply chains for fisheries, what is the rule of, uh, of, um, of diversified uh, global market for fish product, is that uh, simplifying local systems or not, these type of cross-scale dynamics that are highly, highly unexplored still. And uh, we have a research program here in Stockholm where we try to get at these type of new feedbacks between humans and, and, and the ecosystems that have not really been, <laughs> been captured fully so far. Uh, if we take the next step after this sort of state-of-the-art picture I gave you right now, what is going to happen or what, what are three trends already in, uh, on, uh, ongoing? The first one was the one I just talked about, a new type of connectivity mobility and new type of linkages with, with uh, some of them going really fast, extremely fast and um, new, new type of uh, shocks and, and surprises that, that basically place us in a new terrain. We can't take for granted that the, the environment is as stable as, it, as we have had it in the last decades or so. We often, we often think about it as, as perhaps having incremental changes but but it may, it may be that we're moving into a new type of situation uh, right now. The second one is the enormous revolution we're in right now. And it's, it's like moving back to the 1920s and try to predict what, what we have today. Who would be able to do that? So that's an enormous revolution, a fantastic opportunity, but also a lot of stewardship challenges in it. With, with um, information technology and, and the whole going deeper and deeper down into the biological domain. And then, and then what's happening also now with the new acceleration taking place in, in countries with many, many people like India and China. So, th so this is a situation we're facing on Earth right now. We're, we're, we are truly in this Anthropocene of, of, of living on an Earth where we are, we are shaping things. And it also means that if we want to have a good life for people, we have to be, become stewards of this future in a more active way, perhaps, than we have done before. Uh, so uh, even a journal like The Economist that doesn't talk so much about the stuff that uh, people in this room normally deal with or, or we deal with uh, had a special uh, an issue in uh, last year in May where they talked about uh, the Anthropocene uh, and basically arguing that uh, we now have become a geological force based on, on uh, a lot of those uh, evidence, which is quite impressive actually for a species to become a geological force on Earth. So we, we really are, we are shaping uh, key processes on Earth in that sense. We talk about this as the big challenge now for humanity is really try to reconnect to the biosphere that we are part of. So, so in, in, about, in about two to three generations, several se segments of society has created the mindset like humans actually are independent on, on, on Earth. If, if we look at we look at, an, uh, from an economic side, we look at the environment as an externality that we occasionally try to get a price on to bring it into the economy. So from that perspective, the economy is center of the universe and, and the, the, the environment is just an input to, the, to it. In other social sciences, there are no, no environment whatsoever involved in, in the way you study social sciences. There are, no, there are no biosphere there, actually. So we become almost illiterate as a, as a species in about our rule in the, on the planet. Uh, luckily, that is uh, changing now fast, I think. I think there is a big reconnect, reconnection going on, uh, with, with uh, especially perhaps triggered by the climate uh, discussions. But, but these, these things are, are, are big challenges and a reality for us on Earth. So in that, in that, sen in that sense, and I think for this group who deals with fisheries, it's, it's not about saving or conserving uh, species and the environment. It's, it's, about, it's about securing ourselves on Earth, basically, because, of course, the planet doesn't care if we are here or not. It's because it, as long as the sun shines, there will be good evolution on the Earth. But the question is, how will our life look like on Earth uh, now and in the future? So, so that's why we talk a lot about ecosystem stewardship. How can we become stewards of our own future in, in a better way? And I think that's listen to what you're doing here, that's very much the challenge here of, of moving from 
species to stewardship of marine systems and, and thinking about those in terms of, of, of what they generate for humanity. So in my mindset, uh, the whole idea of dividing up people and nature in two different uh, segments, as we're still doing when we generate knowledge, natural sciences, social sciences, humanities, I think it's an outdated way of looking at, looking at it right now. I think we have to th start thinking about it as a truly integrated system, where people are part of the, uh, people are part of the ecosystems, but uh, shaping it completely, but at the same time completely dependent on it <coughs> for, for, uh, for food, water, and, uh, and, other, and other critical ecosystem services. So this concept of ecosystem services, I think, is an interesting one that I haven't seen so much in the program here, and I think that's something for ISIS to think about, really, uh, the role of marine ecosystem services. Uh, in the Millennium e Ecosystem Assessment, uh, they were classified as provisional services, which inclu would include goods, basically, like uh, fish stocks. Uh, and then it was regulating services, like uh, production of, of um, good habitats for, uh, for seafood production. And then there were supporting services and cultural services also. That's the way it was divided up there. Uh, if, if we would like to have a sustainable supply of these type of services, we, of course, need to be good stewards of them. Uh, grazing, for example, of coral reefs are important for uh, reef generation and seafood production, of course, estuaries and other things. Here's an example from, from Maine that has been described by social scientists, that's perhaps one of the best success stories of how people have come together from local fishermen in, uh, uh, harvesting the lobster all the way up to global markets. And, and, and it's a real exemplary way of collective action. People have, have uh, collaborate from the local level all the way up to global markets. And one of the successes there has been that the lobster has not been overexploited compared to many other other fisheries earlier in the Gulf of Maine. And, uh, and uh, people like Eleanor Ostrom and other, uh, others who have done a lot of property rights and collective action have used this example as, uh, as one of the success stories. But uh, it's, uh, is it really a, a success story if you broaden it to more of an ecosystem-based approach? So if you, look, if you look at it over historical time, it seems like uh, it's not only due, due to good governance, but it's also due to removal of predators on the lobsters and other factors that have created this enormous lobster boom. And, uh, and further south, as many people in this room know better than I do, uh, there's been a loss of lobsters due to disease. So this is an example of one of these new interac interacting feedbacks, uh, emerging diseases that uh, if, we have, if we have large monocultures, like in this case of lobsters, you you may become really vulnerable to, to, the, uh, to the production of lobster. And in this case, <coughs> at least the scientific community had not recognized, it, recognized that vulnerability because they, they believed that the whole governance structure was really successful in managing the lobster, based on basically looking at one species at the time. But he here we have a situation where huge monoculture has been created and actually an accident uh, waiting to happen for, for, for that fisheries. Uh, and the question is, what ha happens? Uh, okay, the lobster may collapse and then it may come back if you only look at it biologically, but what happens socially and economically in these type of situations? It, it may be this type of uh, things happening, actually, and, and, and I know that several of you in this room have been uh, interested in this type of uh, research on, on tipping points and sustainable transitions. And, of course, if it sits there for a little while, that's okay for the donkey, but there is a time limit to... to uh, to sustainability for the donkey there. So when we look at these type of shifts, sometimes we call them regime shifts. Uh, one way is really to try to understand them. What, what are they all about? And that's not an easy task, as many of you knew. And uh, for that purpose, the Resilience Center, we have developed a website trying to summarize some of the key feedbacks and drivers in different domains uh, or different pathways of ecosystem development that if you're interested, you can have a look at. Then the, qu then the question is, what do you do if you, if you would like to be stewards of uh, these type of different regimes? One is you try to, to adapt, you try to stay on where you are. If this is a good one, then you try to figure out how can, how can we stay on this pathway of development in the face of fin uh, changes, actually. So the changes may be climate change, it may be a financial 
market collapse, but how can we stay on this pathway? And that we call adaptability, and there's a huge research on adaptability in many parts of the world, in lots in, lots in coastal communities in relation to livelihood and things like that. Another, another way to think about this is that, that we're in a place that we don't want to be in, if we're in a trap, or if we're in a bad development pathway, in a poverty trap, for example, or in a, in a, in a lock-in in fisheries where we, can't, where we can't get out of the subsidy system. How can we break that, basically? How can we get out of it? To go back to what we had before, or to go into something completely new? And the something completely new is what I think is really uh, the big challenge for, for us in the future, to shift into new pathways. We call that transformations, and I come back to that in a little while. But the ball and the cup is a way of very simplistically illustrate this type of uh, shifts, where where the left side has has a high resilience means that if if it gets shaken up by a disturbance, it will remain on the same pathway. But if if it has low resilience, it maybe flip over into another pathway. <coughs> Yesterday we I heard a talk about uh, this type of uh, shifts for caught in the Barents Sea. And uh, if you look at the figure to the, uh, to the right there, you see this type of, of ball and the cup. And it's, it's a curve below it called the hysteresis curve. So if you follow the left part of that one, the blue, blue one, and uh, up to this, what does it say, F2, you may do small, small incremental changes and nothing happens. And then you make the same change again and then it suddenly flips over into another, another uh, pathway. And the point is that Say that that is nutrient in, in influ flux to a coastal area. So if you have, say, 100 kilos of nutrients coming in and that generates the flip, it's not enough to take away 100 kilos of nutrients and then you get it back. You have to go all the way back beyond F1 to, to get the flip back. That's the hysteresis curve. And that's a big discussion to what extent that happens in, or not. But it definitely happens in, in, in some uh, terrestrial systems and, and also in lakes and in some coastal areas. Whether it happens in marine systems or not, that the, the jury is still out there, I think. Uh, three, three aspects of how we are dealing with uh, this type of uh, resilience that I will define very soon, but what we do with systems is, is of course the classical one of pouring in stuff into the environment uh, and also uh, ha having impacts like uh, climate change. The second one is altering functional diversity, response diversity, and also modularity of, of the system. And that I know that several of you have been interested in that. I heard some talks about the Barents Sea yesterday. Uh, and the last one that perhaps we don't think of that much always is the how we alter the disturbance regimes of, of organisms that many organisms have been adapted to, uh, changing them in, in frequency, magnitude, and duration. So these three things combined is a way of lo looking at, at how humans are shaping, shaping our systems, including marine systems. Some regime shifts that have been talked about a lot is coral reefs, kelps, sea urchins, and also for the, for the Black Sea, the fish, yellowfish shift. At the more regional scales, we have uh, a group uh, in, at Potsdam and here in, or in the UK that have identified uh, areas of potential uh, flips or regime shifts in, in the global system. And here I guess you recognize uh, several of those uh, that have been that are on the table often, but I think this is one of the first to put them together uh, in this way. And uh, on the global level then, this is a graph from the last 100,000 years on Earth f through ice cores on, in Greenland and the uh, uh, measurement of, um, of oxygen on, on the left side. And you can see that this is the period where we started to, to, to move around and uh, come, up, come up as a species on Earth. And many people now argue that it was really hard to do anything else than be a nomad during the first 90,000 years of this part of Earth history. And this last 10,000 years is the Holocene era. And, it, and uh, when that uh, stabilization happened, it took a uh, little less than 2,000 years, then we started with agriculture. So this is the era where all uh, our, our civilizations and culture have existed, actually, in the way we, we knew of it. It's a very short, uh, perhaps an exception in the history of Earth, and it's a very short uh, timescale, of course, on, 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 on geological timescale. 
But often we as humans take, take these conditions for absolutely for granted. This is the way Earth is and will always be. And there may, may, may be a small fluctuation, uh, fluctuations here and there. This is why we did this work on uh, planetary boundaries. I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, we did a try to uh, bring together lots of groups specialized in different aspects of, of the Earth system to see whether what features need to be working in certain ways for the Earth to remain in this Holocene-like uh, phase. That, that because that's where we want to be. Of course, as humans, that's where it's stable. We can develop and be many people on Earth. Uh, so we tried to uh, put that together, not uh, as, as a suggestion for a way of looking at, at the, the functioning of the biosphere as absolutely critical for, for um, uh, human development. So not only the climate issue, but uh, lots of other issues as well, uh, as, as a reflection of, of, um, of, of us on, on Earth. And we, we talked about it as, as a safe operating space for the future of humanity. That uh, we try to, if we, can, if we can sort of respect and deal with these sort of boundaries wherever they are, and some may have thresholds in them, if we can deal with that in a good way, then we will have a big opportunity to, to continue a good life for people on Earth. But first, if we don't see it at all, if we think we're, we're totally independent of it, then, and if we just continue another two, three great accelerations, it may be tricky to have the Earth in the Holocene-like state. So that's, of course, a challenge. And I think the marine, the marine fisheries part is part of that story because the conclusions I heard yesterday that we are now, we can't, even if we develop new fisheries, we can't really increase the fisheries very much. So we have to combine it with aquaculture. So all over the place, we're in, in many situations in the same situation. There are even those who start to talk about uh, shifts in the whole uh, Earth uh, system now. Ranoski and a lot, lot of groups here, and, and Jordi Bascomte, who some of you work with on food webs and things like that, uh, have had a paper on that. And, uh, and well, what should we think about that? But it's, it's, it, the discussion is up there whether, whether the Earth system actually may flip over into another type of state. And uh, yeah, we can all imagine what that means. Okay, so just to sum up that first part of, the, of, of my presentation is really about the economy and, and human society is being part of the planet, quite obvious, and we are dependent on the functioning planet for our own well-being into the future. And if we, if we don't recognize that, there will be surprises, of course. The, w the way we popularly Defined resilience basically is the capacity to deal with change and continue to develop, turning crises into opportunities. There are many good sto stories of doing that, turning crises into opportunities. Hurricane Mitch in Honduras reshaped uh, the way local communities operated and even created more, more just and effective uh, social system afterwards in some places. Cayman Island have learned to deal with storms and floods in new ways as crisis management. Coral reefs in Australia have shifted perspective from single reefs to seascapes and uh, flood management in, U in, in the EU and other places. So there's enormous learning going on right now, how to deal, to deal with these challenges. The definition that we often use in the Resilience Alliance is Brian Walker's and others' definition 2004. It's the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change. And basically remain not the same system, but continue to develop on the same pathway. That, that's what resilience is about. There are a lot of work trying to uh, measure and capture resilience now, not personalizing it. I, I just mentioned some from the coral reef community, a lot of stuff going on there, all the way from uh, indicators of reef uh, resilience to the rule of functional diversity and, and the especially the grazing guild for, for reef uh, uh, resilience summed up recent, fairly recently by Tim McLennan and people in, in, in uh, PLOS One, I think it was. Here are some of the areas that our people are working on a lot now. Uh, the first early warnings and the uh, recovery rates, critical slowing down, flickering. Uh, Martin Schaeffer and many others are working on, on how, how you can try to detect if you're close to a threshold or not. And I know some of you in the room are, are dealing with these type of issues also. Functional and response diversity, modularity, connectivity, another, another area of really looking at the role of the diversity in, in ecosystem dynamics. Feedback management, fast and slow variables, how they interact, how you break this feedback 
how you avoid masking feedbacks. These type of, that's a big area also. Uh, especially how if you're in a, in a system you don't want to be in, how can you break, break the feedbacks to shift it back or shift it into new pathways? Disturbance regimes, that lot, you know, there is a whole community dealing with the crisis management and, and natural disasters and that type of stuff. And also windows of opportunity, how can you shift crisis into new opportunities? And on the right side, more of the social aspects on these things. Um, I can mention number eight there, uh, Europe have had had something called the, the uh, TEEB, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, trying to capture the role of ecosystem services and and also resilience to some extent for, for uh, economic development. To continue with the resilience thinking, when we, th when we think about it, we have three aspects that we, for us is crucial. The first is resilience as persistence, and I think that that's what most people think about as resilience. Basically, how can, you, how can you buffer things, how can you absorb things, and how can you continue the way you are before, uh, like you were before? Adaptability, that's really trying to manage resilience on that pathway. It's trying to continue where you, where you are on the same pathway. Uh, sustain what you have and develop it on, the, on that pathway. Transformation then is, is shifting into another pathway uh, and, and uh, into new development, into new trajectories. And of course, all of those in interrelate across multiple scales. Uh, some conclusions from the Earth and the Holocene is some people argue now that if we, w if we want to persist, which if we want to have a resilient global system in the Holocene era or in, in a Holocene-like state, we have to start trans transform the way we do things at local and regional scales. So if we continue to adapt by just continuously expand like we've been doing now for a while, that will be tricky for us in the future. Well, you, you can imagine all that yourself. So many people say that in order to, to have a good life for humans into the future, we need transformations into new pathways. So how can we mobilize our innovative capacity? How can we mobilize our way of, of, uh, of creating new technologies to collaborate with the planet insta instead of trying to make us independent of it? That's, that's a, big, a big shift in the way we think about things. How can we be stewards of our landscapes and seascapes? How can we be stewards of landscapes and seascapes for urban systems, for example? How can urban systems create incentives for uh, marine, t marine stewardship to secure that, uh, that we don't, uh, that we don't uh, reuse them? We have looked into uh, some cases of uh, these type of transformations, and I'll go through them now uh, a little bit. And uh, one is from Chile, uh, a shift from uh, uncoordinated uh, management of, of uh, seafood to uh, cooperatives and collective action and collaborative management. The second one is from uh, the Great Barrier Reef. And the third is from an, uh, an urban landscape, semi-urban semi landscape close to the Baltic Sea that is connected to eutrophication issues and things like that. What, what uh, comes out is a sort of tentative little way of thinking about those things, how these type of shifts can take place, and I think that may be interesting for this group in relation to marine stewardship and and um, and integrated uh, ecosystem management and these type of of ideas that are coming up more and more, and also from the EU, how can we do marine ecosystem management, marine ecosystem stewardship? So what I will do now is to move from understanding what's going on in the ecosystem and how you manage that to look at social features that hinders or allows for stewardship of ecosystems, basically. Basically, the governance system, the system that sets, uh, sets up the rules and norms, the social interactions that makes it possible to have stewardship of marine ecosystems. So, so that's the social part of social ecological systems now. I'll go into a little bit. And what we find in many of those cases that have made those shift is often that there is a, a phase, can be up to four, five, ten years of preparing for trying to have the shifts, but it's impossible to do because there are barriers to the shift. There may be legal barriers, maybe economic barriers, maybe political barriers or other things that, that doesn't allow for it. But then for different reasons, suddenly things are changing and often there are, some people would call it a crisis, other people would call it windows of opportunities. 
And it may be, it may be that a financial boom or financial bust together with an environmental uh, effect may, may open up a window. It may be that a, a shift in, pol in political structure may open up a window. And, and that's when you can do it. You can't, you, it's very seldom you can do it incrementally. You can't, you, you can't say, now we should do it like this in 10 years. Because there are barriers to it. There are subsidies, there are legal things, you, you know all that. And people have tried to get good stewardship going, but why doesn't it happen, these stupid politicians and all of that stuff, you know? <laughs> uh, it's, it's really about timing here and being prepared for those windows when they open up. Uh, and all the cases we looked at that have been able to shift have made use of these type of windows of opportunities. And when that happened, they take the whole new way of looking at things into through that window and try to make it sort of sit in the new situation. And then if it does, they try to strengthen it so it sits longer. And that's why they try to build build resilience of the new direction. I start with the one from southern Sweden. Uh, this place here is called Kristianstad and um, it was looked upon as a water sick area before. There's too much bloody water here, we have to get rid of it. Pump it away and so on and so forth. Today it's called the uh, Kristianstads Vattenrike, which is a sort of a water rich kingdom or something like that. So they totally shifted mindsets basically to to recognize that 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 we have something valuable here. We actually if we if we ma if we are become the stewards of the water, we can generate a lot of ecosystem services, both for food production, for uh, for nutrient nutrient abatement, but also for tourism and other things. So what happened was that they basically had a had a crisis in the region of of the landscape growing through, uh, having difficulty dealing with the water. And they shifted mindset. And that's like a tipping point in the mental, it's like a tipping point in, in, in the way you think about things. Shifting it into recognizing that if we can become stewards of the whole landscape, uh, we will be better off, basically. So uh, there were a couple of three key people who started to develop this vision. And a handful of people and then uh, started to build networks, started to communicate with actors in the area. And then, then they got the whole everyone on board. But again, at that time when everyone was on board, it was small firms, it was uh, tourist uh, sectors, it was a uh, uh, lot of different activities in the region. They couldn't take off because they were, they were blocked at higher levels. But then after a while, through networks, interactions and political change, they could take it through to the municipality and, and the county and then later on to the state level. And now they're uh, one of those mine and the biosphere areas. Uh, so, so they transformed the whole governance system actually from uncoordinated ma management of lots of different things, having no interaction with this, each other, to connecting them into a whole management system. And what we found in many of those uh, systems, uh, or in these situations, is there are four features that are critical. It's the level of agency or individual actors that build new type of organizational structures that connect things, uh, that have... A, use old norms and rules or develop new ones, the institutions, and, and have strong social networks that they connect or build new ones. And there's learning going on all the time. And often there has to be an enabling environment from higher levels to make it happen. The other one is from Chile. It's not an environment uh, crisis here, but it's, um, it's actually a, a shift that happened uh, in, in a really bad phase. You remember Chile had a pretty bad situation for, for quite some time with a dictator who created a mess in the country. Before he, he, he came in, it, it would have been really hard to start to coordinate, coordinate coastal, coastal uh, management. But because of this enormous t turbulence that happened in that phase, it, it almost became blank, so they could restart the system at the end of his uh, dictatorship. And, and there you had you had uh, fishermen and scientists coming together <laughs> and uh, thinking about how can we develop this uh, better stewardship of our coastal resources. So they created, created a new type of um, uh, collaborative management or, or uh, co-ops called cayetas that, uh, that they manage as groups for, for um, shellfish production. And uh, 
and now later on it has evolved into a, a management system that is connected all the way up to, <coughs> to the legal system in Chile. And it's, it's not working super well, but it's worked much, much better than it did before. Uh, so that's an example of, of a, a shock, political, really bad situation that may shift what you do into completely new pathway of stewardship. So it doesn't always have to be climate shocks or shocks in rain, uh, changes in rainfall or things like that. It can be social and political shocks that make these type of change happen. The last one is uh, from the Great Barrier Reef where, where uh, the early view of the reef was that they are so far out from the coast. If we protect a couple of percentage of the reefs, <coughs> they will always continue to be there. And then uh, after, uh, say, 10 to 15 years recognition of that it's not as simple as that, that potential warming through climate and, and also some extent of, of fishing of especially herbivorous species that are critical in regenerating reefs and also run off from sugar canes and other, other activities on land actually challenge the resilience of the reef. So what happened in the Great Barrier Reef was was that they used a mapping exercise for the reef where they shift from only having coral reefs to dividing up the seascape in 70, 70 different habitats. And they looked at those as, as an interacting uh, seascape. And because of lack of knowledge and uh, lack of understanding of ho how those different habitats interact, they also, uh, as an insurance, put in uh, many more marine reserves for, for that reason. But the interesting point is that they, they were able to, sh at, the, uh, at the nation scale, to make a change from, from not having that type of connec connection at all to, to looking now at the, at, at, the seas at the seascape for stewardship of the reefs and, and other resources and ecosystem services in the area. <coughs> and uh, I won't go through these uh, bullet points at the left, but uh, if you're interested, uh, we had a piece in uh, 2008 that described, described what happened socially in this governance shift actually. So, of course, if you, if you reduce your fisheries here and get fish from elsewhere, uh, that hasn't re reduced the fishing pressure. But anyhow, it's a complete shift in mindset. It's like a tipping point of, of moving from single reefs to whole seascapes and start to collaborate around that. And again, it was made possible by a couple of leaders, former politician, uh, lead scientist at the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, and so on and so forth, that were able to mobilize uh, groups and they had a lot of stakeholder meetings and a lot of other uh, activities around it and, and, uh, and it happened. The jury is still out there whether it will be successful or not but it has shifted towards a real attempt for stewardship of a, of a large scale marine ecosystem. So the question is again is it a success or not uh, these type of transformations. A few features that we find in all these things is, is, uh, is functional groups of people you could say if you're, if, if you're into the b more into the ecology you think about functional diversity. These are uh, categories of uh, what people do in many of those situations. Uh, examples of that, that that often are needed for, for, for um, good stewardship of, of ecosystem services. Single actors or groups of actors can actually make these shifts, ha shifts happen. Uh, in the management literature they are called institutional entrepreneurs. And I guess there are institutional entrepreneurs in this room also who are working to, to think about how we can better stewards of, of marine ecosystems. N another type of um, organizations that are really critical is what we call bridging organizations, organizations that can connect the local to higher levels of governance. Uh, a group at Harvard called them boundary organizations, uh, which means uh, organizations that can combine different knowledges and make, uh, make use of it. Uh, we call them bridging organizations because uh, it's more than knowledge, it's, it's how you organize yourself, how you build trust, how you create shared visions, and, and uh, how you create platforms for continuous learning. And like we try to do here in the scientific community, we have these, we have these annual meetings uh, where you interact and have shared learning and discuss things. So these type of collaborative platforms are really important for stewardship also. That's when new information com comes in, uh, new interests and conflicts are resolved and so on and so forth. Another type of feature which is really crit critical is networks, social networks. 
and some of them are, of course, obviously very visible and, and uh, easily to understand, and especially if they are formal networks with uh, legal uh, rules and norms uh, that are highly visible. But often there are players in the background, uh, which are often called shadow networks, that are not really super visible, uh, you don't always uh, perceive them, but, but they often play a pl critical role in, in uh, these type of interactions and to make things happen. And uh, one case of that is, <coughs> is uh, some st p studies done by a colleague of mine, Henrik Österblom and others, uh, who looked at uh, the e unregulated and illegal and unreported fishing, fishing in the Southern Ocean of, um, of tooth fish and how that developed in, into a fairly uh, interesting adaptive governance system now at the global level. So, so this is an example of how, how pe people and later nations can come together and develop, try to develop a stewardship of, uh, of a regional resource at, from at the global level, actually. And uh, th this picture, which is from a recent paper in Conservation Biology, illustrates how these networks became more, more formalized after a while and, and consists of different categories of players for dealing with different issues around, around stewardship of, of, that, of that marine resource. Earlier on, it was, uh, before this uh, became formalized, it was a lot of shadow networks. It actually started with a few individuals in Norway who were uh, annoyed that the fishing fleets were going down from Norway fishing elsewhere. And they uh, started to connect networks. And then it started to self-organize like this. For a while, it didn't work out. Uh, it collapsed, but then it took off again. And then it got connected to Camelor. And, and, um, and started to work better. And here's a, here's a piece where, where this emergence of these networks from left to right uh, also are connected to if this fisheries data is correct, curbing some of the illegal overfishing. So, so in my mind, that's an example of, a hopeful example of that we actually can get our, get together and try to have uh, adaptive management or adaptive governance of, 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 a, of a regional resource at the global level. Okay, so to sum up three of the examples I just gave you. Uh, the first one from Maine uh, is an illustration of that adap adaptation in the uh, social adaptation and collective action may actually lead to traps and vulnerable social ecological systems if you forget about the ecosystem, which is no risk that this group will do, <laughs> but there are many other groups in the world who, who, who does that all the time in decision making, especially in the context that we have 50% of the human population in urban areas, and that's often where most of the decisions are being made. So again, if you only, if you only manage the social domain by itself, without the ecosystem, you may be hit by surprises. The second one was the one from Chile, where a political crisis, totally disconnected from environmental issues, uh, opened up opportunities for transformational change and also reduced poverty in the region. The third one was the one I just gave about open access and unsustainable extraction that can be curbed by international adaptive governance. So these were three examples of social ecological systems uh, connected to the marine realm, realm that, that work in that way. I think I skipped that one. Uh, I just mentioned that we had uh, last year um, a symposium where we tried to provide input uh, for the re plus 20 process, but also in a series of something called Nobel Laureate Symposiums. And, and we did a special feature of Ambient. Several things that I talked about are summarized in these papers here. So if you're interested in that, that may be something to look at. Uh, here are some interpretations that came out of that, uh, that, that uh, symposium. This is the French, uh, the French interpretation of, uh, of uh, the Great Acceleration. Basically, we're eating up the planet. This is sort of cultural differences here. Here is uh, from uh, uh, Time Magazine. Here's the US interpretation of, of uh, the Anthropocene. And, and as I showed you before, here's the, the economist interpretation. I just finish up with a picture from a paper that I did with Martin Schaeffer and Carpenter and Francis Wesley, on, we call accounting for the non-computable, we call it. And uh, this would uh, sort of illustrate 
the specialization we have in, in science of understanding parts, but perhaps not always connecting the parts. And when we try to connect them across disciplines, it sometimes becomes really blurry. Uh, and, uh, and for some of you who have been dealing with resilience and stuff like that, that's what uh, I know some of you may think that it's really blurry. And, and you're right in many dimensions, but, uh, but uh, that's part of the scientific discourse. But often when you, when, when then when the picture starts to become a little bit clearer, hopefully, hopefully you get a bit surprised and ha have to re reassess some of the things that you thought about were absolute truth earlier on. Okay, I think I stopped. Thank you very much.